Well, good morning and welcome to worship this Sunday, April the 3rd. We are really glad that you are with us for um, this uh, fourth Sunday of Lent. Actually, I think it's the fifth Sunday of Lent. And uh, we are focusing today on um, the wor Jesus' words of suffering. In the spirit of reconciliation, we acknowledge that we live, work, and play on the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy, Siksika, Kanai, Pakani, the Sutina, the Stony Nakoda Nations, the Métis Nations, Region 3, and all people who make their homes in the Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta. And if anybody can identify with the sufferings of Christ, our Indigenous neighbours certainly are some of those. We also reaffirm our pledge to stand for justice and our commitment to that our church is a place where all people, regardless of race, culture, sexuality, or faith, are welcome. Together we hope that all can find the true love of God, healing in their suffering, and authentic community. Our call to worship today. As we are called into worship today, it is sobering to remember that when God appeared on earth in the person of Jesus, most of the world didn't recognize him and therefore did not worship him. Today, we ask for faith that will open our eyes to see Jesus for who he is. Help us to acknowledge his suffering and help us to be people who worship him in truth. People of God, behold and see your God. Amen and amen. Our scripture today, the first scripture comes from Psalm uh, 69 verses, starting at verse 16, we'll read to verse 29. Psalm 69. Answer me, Lord, out of the goodness of your love. In your great mercy, turn to me. Do not hide your face from your servant. Answer me quickly, for I am in trouble. Come near and rescue me. Deliver me because of my foes. You know how I am scorned, disgraced, and shame. All my enemies are before you. Scorn has broken my heart and left me helpless. I looked for sympathy, but there was none for comforters, but I found none. They put gall in my food and gave me vinegar for my thirst. May the table set before them become a snare. May it become retribution and a trap. May their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see and their backs be bent forever. Pour out your wrath on them. Let your fierce anger overtake them. May their place be deserted. Let there be no one to dwell in their tents. For they persecute those you wound and talk about the pain of those you hurt. Charge them with crime upon crime. Do not let them share in your salvation. May they be blotted out of the book of life and not be listed with the righteous. But as for me, afflicted in pain, may your salvation, God, protect me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Since 2014, the number of people affected by hunger globally has been rising. Tens of millions have joined the ranks of the chronically undernourished over the past five years, and countries around the world continue to struggle with multiple forms of malnutrition. High food costs mean billions cannot afford nutritious meals. It's estimated that the COVID-19 pandemic led to over 800 million people facing chronic hunger by the end of the year. You are invited to be a virtual farmer. Your gift will fund seeds and inputs for the growing season, and a Canadian farmer will then use this money to grow a crop on an acre of land alongside their own. At harvest time, the farmer will sell the crop produced on your acre, and then will donate 100% of the proceeds to the CBM account at the Canadian Food Grains Bank. Your gift is then matched up to four to one through a program with the Government of Canada when it is used to support emergency food aid in places like Lebanon, and so Sudan, where the global pandemic has added additional challenges to already difficult circumstances. A gift of $25 could result in over $150 of food aid through our partners.
Let us pray together, shall we? Holy and merciful God, we confess to you and to one another and to the whole communion of saints in heaven and on earth that we have sinned by our own fault in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We have not forgiven others as we have been forgiven. Have mercy on us, O oh God. We have not listened to your call to serve Christ, serve as Christ served us. We have not been true to the mind of Christ. We have grieved your Holy Spirit. Have mercy on us, O oh God. We confess to you, O oh God, that all our past unfaithfulness, the pride, hypocrisy, and impatience in our lives. We confess to you, O oh God, our indulgent appetites and ways and our exploitation of other people. We confess to you, O oh God, our anger at our own frustration and our envy of for those who are more fortunate than ourselves. We confess to you, O oh God, our intemperate love of worldly goods and comforts and our dishonesty in daily life and work. We confess to you, O oh God, our negligence in prayer and worship and our failure to commend the faith that is in us. Accept our repentance, O God, for the wrongs we have done, for our neglect and human need and suffering and our indifference in, to injustice and cruelty. Accept our repentance, O God, and thank you for your promise and assurance of forgiveness. God, your gracious love has embraced, for us has embraced that long and lonely journey to the cross. Gather us close to you in these days when we again make the journey in meditation and recollection, remembrance and repentance. Help us to contemplate again the way taken by our Savior, the false charges brought against him, the fear and flight of the disciples, the kiss of the betrayal, the crown of the, the crown of thorns, the purple robe, and in our contemplation, give us courage to face those times in our own lives when he received the same at our hands. Yet help us also remember that you have gone before us, so we look to you for compassion and forgiveness, knowing you are able to save. When we are weak, make us strong. When hurt and resentful, make us forgiving. When defeated and discouraged, make us hopeful. Give us, keep us from asking for mercy without giving it ourselves, from praying for your kingdom, but never working for it. This week, deepen our faith by your matchless grace. Deepen the measure of our gratitude and obedience. Move us who have so much to share with others who have so little. Uphold us when we summon our courage to speak out for the stranger and the foreigner within our gates and for those long denied dignity and freedom. We pray for all of those who need your extra touch this week, for those in our congregation, in our city, in our country, and in our world, for all who are suffering from illness, from anxiety, from war and unrest, from turmoil and upheaval. You understand suffering, and we pray that you will comfort them. May your peace reign in our hearts, our lives, and your world. Guard and guide us through these days of Lent, meditation and remembrance. Guard and guide us through all our days until we come at last to the day when all our days and journeys will be gathered into your eternity and sh we shall be with you forever. Glory to God. Amen. Our second scripture today is from the Gospel of John, chapter 19. I'm going to read the whole thing. It is a bit long. Um, I'm reading from the message this morning. John 19, starting at verse 1. So Pilate took Jesus and had him whipped. 
The soldiers, having braided a crown of thorns, set it on his head, threw a purple robe over him and approached him with, Hail, King of the Jews. Then they greeted him with slaps in the face. Pilate went back out and said to them, I present him to you, but I want you to know that I do not find him guilty of any crime. Just then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate announced, here is the man. When the high priests and police saw him, they shouted in a frenzy, crucify, crucify. Pilate told them, you take him, you crucify him. I find nothing wrong with him. The Jews answered, we have a law and by that law, he must die because he claimed to be the son of God. When Pilate heard this, he became even more scared. He went back into the palace and said to Jesus, where did you come from? Jesus gave no answer. Pilate said, you won't talk. Don't you know that I have the authority to pardon you and the authority to crucify you? Jesus said, you haven't a shred of authority over me except what has been given you from heaven. That is why the one who betrayed me to you has committed a far greater fault. At this point, Pilate tried his best to pardon him, but the Jews shouted him down. If you pardon this man, you are no friend of Caesar's. Anyone setting himself up as king defies Caesar. When Pilate heard these words, he led Jesus outside. He sat at the judgment seat in the area designated stone court, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. It was the pre preparation day for Passover. The hour was noon. Pilate said to the Jews, here is your king. And they shouted back, kill him, kill him, crucify him. Pilate said, I am to crucify your king. The high priests answered, we have no king except Caesar. Pilate caved into their demands. He turned him over to be crucified and they took Jesus away. Carrying his cross, Jesus went to the place called Skull Hill, which in Hebrew is Golgotha, where they crucified him. And with him, two others, one on each side, Jesus in the middle. Pilate wrote out a sign and had it placed on the cross. It read, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read the sign because the place where Jesus was crucified was right next to the city. It was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. The Jewish high priests objected. Don't write, they said to Pilate, the King of the Jews. Make it, this man said, I am the King of the Jews. Pilate said, what I've written, I've written. And when they crucified him, the Roman soldiers took his clothes and divided them up four ways to each soldier a fourth. But his robe was seamless, a single piece of weaving. So they said to each other, let us not tear it up. Let's throw dice to see who gets it. This confirmed the scripture that said, they divided up my clothes among them and threw dice for my coat. The soldiers validated the scriptures. And while the soldiers were looking after themselves, Jesus' mother, his aunt, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene stood at the foot of the cross. Jesus saw his mother and the disciple he loved standing there. He said to his mother, woman, here is your son. Then to the disciple, here is your mother. From that moment, the disciple accepted her as his own mother. Jesus, seeing that everything had been completed so that the scripture record must, might also be complete, then said, I'm thirsty. And a jug of sour wine was standing by. Some put it on a sponge, soaked with wine on a javelin and lifted it to his mouth. After he took the wine, Jesus said, it's done, complete. And bowing his head, he offered up his spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, it is the fifth, uh, sorry, the four, uh, fifth Sunday of Lent. And some call it Passion Sunday. And we have been looking at words that Jesus said from the cross. And our cross word for today is suffering. Christ's words on the cross I thirst, indicate his suffering. Now, I find this one a really interesting one. It's a real paradox because every drop of water owes its origin to him, to Christ. 
Every gurgling, rushing, pure, pristine mountain stream comes from his hand. Every deep, satisfying well exists because of his created world. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made, John 1 tells us. And yet, he cries out in agony, I thirst. To the woman at the well, he had said, everyone who drinks this water will thir be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. John 4. And yet, he cries, I thirst. And then he said, John 7, whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from them. But he cries in agony, I thirst. And Revelation 22 at the end of our scriptures says, the bride and the, the spirit and the bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. Let the one who is thirsty, come. And let the one who wishes to take the free gift of the water of life. And still he cries in agony. I thirst. The crucifixion is the most painful of all deaths. And part of that pain is the extreme thirst that accompanies it. Soldiers are, have been known to endure excruciating pain from their wounds but they will cry out in desperation for water. Patients in the hospital go almost frantic for even a few drops of water sometimes. People stranded in the desert will drink sand because they become so desperate for water. People at sea have become so crazy for water that they drink the seawater, which makes them even more thirsty and a vicious cycle begins. You get the picture. The worst sort of anguish and suffering is death from unrelieved thirst. And the fact that Jesus suffered this way is part of the proof, if you will, that he was indeed human. He was the son of God, but he was also the son of man. And he definitely thirsted. Jesus came down into this messy, mucky, filthy world he came to where we are. He moved into our neighborhoods and took on our very nature, our needs, our life, so that he could show us how much God loves us. And he suffered. He became one of us so that we might become one with him. But this is also a symbolic cry of thirst. The first time Jesus was offered a, a drink of wine during the crucifixion. He turned it down because it was drugged wine. It was designed to deaden the pain and dull the senses. But this time, the second time, he's offered sour wine or vinegar. He took it. First, because it fulfilled another prophecy, and we know that he fulfilled all of them. And secondly, because it gave him enough time to utter his last words. It is finished. It is symbolic that he suffered physical thirst so that he can quench our spiritual thirst. It is our thirst for God's redemption, for the fellowship and the relationship and the companionship with him that we crave. This is what we were created for. This is the thirst that can only be quenched by drinking the living water of God in Jesus Christ. But make no mistake, Jesus suffered and he suffered greatly. Suffering is an inevitable part of life, isn't it? And we all thirst as well. We were born into a world where hunger and thirst and pain and illness and injury and death exist. Some people seem to suffer more than others, but we all suffer. Each of us has our own journey through life. And suffering is a part of that. And we all thirst. During Lent, we should allow ourselves to think about the suffering of Jesus and find small ways to help us identify with that a bit more. 
We mustn't hurry over the pain and suffering to get to the good stuff. When we allow suffering to humble us and to empty us, then we are more able to companion Jesus on his journey of suffering and love. And we are more able and ready to enter into the celebration of life that comes at Easter, the celebration of his resurrection and redemption. When we suffer, it often takes away our ability to control life, and it helps us to understand a little bit more how important it is to let him control our lives. It helps us to emphasize even just a little bit with the suffering of those around us as well. Because we all thirst. I've mentioned before that it is during times of pain and suffering that God does some of the best work in our lives. And when we move past the suffering too quickly, we might miss the lessons that we are to learn there. And it is also when we try to force others to move past their suffering too quickly that we sometimes force them to miss the lessons that God wants them to learn. It's much better to be a companion and sometimes just sit in the midst of the suffering together, praying, crying, thirsting together, and to allow God to companion us together. Jesus, when he was dying on the cross, certainly didn't want anyone to rescue him or, or take him down, but he did want companions along the way. And Jesus still thirsts. We all thirst. He doesn't thirst for living water because he is our living water. Rather, he thirsts still for companionship. He thirsts for the love and devotion of his bride, the church, and his beloved family, us. He longs for our devotion and he wants us to spend time with him, basking in his presence, sharing our thoughts and talking things through with him, listening as he speaks. He yearns for blessed communion with us, each one of us, and as a whole. He suffered and died and rose again for our salvation, our forgiveness, our redemption. He did all this because of his great, amazing love and gift, grace. Amazing grace. He thirsts for you. And we thirst for him. Even so, come Lord Jesus Christ. You suffered as one of us and for us. Be our companion in the times of suffering, we pray. Come, empty us and fill us with your love and grace. Amen. I invite you to prepare for communion uh, at this time and we will celebrate our communion together. And so we come, we come to the table. We come to the Lord's table. Jesus Christ suffered a lot in his life and he suffered an awful lot on the cross. And still, the night he was betrayed, the night before all of this, as all of this happened, Jesus knew what was going to happen and still he longed for the companionship, and the love of his disciples. He longed to spend time with them as he still does today. Jesus said to his disciples, I've eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. And he took the bread and he gave thanks and he gave it to them and said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This 
is Christ, the symbol of Christ's body, broken for you. And be grateful. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Christ's blood shed for each one of us, a symbol of his incredible suffering. And he did it for you. And be thankful. Amen. When we fail to acknowledge Christ's suffering and we turn away from his desire to have our companionship, we too are guilty and a little of the light goes out of the world.